Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you to Justine and the whole Zavitz Insurance uh, family for having us here to speak this evening. Um, I think Aaron's going to make sure the mic is working. Um, so again, my name is Josh. My colleague here, Maral, as well, uh, from Cirrus. We're located in Toronto. And uh, this is, there, there we go. So a little bit about Cirrus as a whole. Uh, we were founded back in 1994, as I said, headquartered in Toronto. Um, we primar primarily provide two main uh, aspects of work to our physicians and dentists across North America. One is lease negotiations. So if anyone is moving their office or looking for a new office or anything like that, we provide that type of assistance as well. And something that we're going to be speaking about tonight, which is my focus, is the healthcare management. So working with family physicians in Ontario to help manage their practice. Uh, we look at all the, the business side of running a practice and essentially you guys are running small businesses and most physicians both newer and seasoned don't always think about it as running a business they think about it as providing patient care so that's where we come in to really give you guys that guidance and assistance when thinking about your business as a as a whole so some quick facts contrary to some people's belief physicians in Ontario are better compensated than anywhere else in Canada Yes, there have been cuts lately, but overall, there has been a, a huge uh, uptake over the last several years. And from what we see, it is a lot higher in Ontario. And I want to say the practices that we work with are a lot higher than other places in Ontario as well. Uh, however, with that being said, 75% of all physicians say that their pay does not align with the care they deliver. And what does that mean? You're providing the care, but you're not being paid appropriately. And a lot of physicians don't even realize that because if I can get a show of it, how many of you look at your RAs on a regular basis? No? Nobody? Okay, so there you go. So a lot of you probably don't even realize where your income is coming from. And that's a question that I ask all the physicians right off the bat is do you know how much you're earning from each major income stream within the FOAM model? And I would say more than 75% say they don't. And that's, again, comes back to the whole thing of running a business versus providing patient care. Uh, physicians believe that their access bonus will never be positive. And I think in, in the London area and in smaller towns, most physicians do have a positive access bonus. So that's more re related to people in more uh, urban areas where there's a walk-in clinic on every corner and they're worried about their access bonus. And they think that I'm negative, I'm never going to be positive, I'm never going to be able to control that. We work with many physicians who come to us with a very negative access bonus, and then we turn it around, we make it positive very quickly, and then we maintain that and even grow it month over month. Um, and again, they're not strategic in how they do things. So right back to the business mindset that you're running a business, and in some cases you need to think of it as running a business and not necessarily only focusing on the uh, quality patient care. Some of you have office managers that do that for you, which is great. But sometimes, you know, to look a little bit deeper, to find those analyses and trends and, and things that are going on within your practice, you need someone dedicated to look at that behind the scenes. And that's what we do. We use all the ministry reports on a regular basis that you guys get, and we provide analysis. And in your folders, uh, we provided a, a sample outside use management analysis, which is one of the many reports that we provide to our physicians on a regular basis. What this, and we'll get through it as we go along, but what this is showing you is who your patients are that are going to the walk-in clinics, what the dollar value is, and the cost-benefit analysis of having them rostered versus unrostered. So the purpose of today's program is to guide you through the faux income streams, give you a better understanding, uh, give you, a, again, a better understanding of where your practice income comes from. Looking at your RA is a great place to start. Looking at the different income streams within there to see what am I actually earning. Yes, you see the, the top number, you see it go into your bank account every month, but sometimes you want to look a little bit deeper and actually understand where that income is coming from. And overall, leave you with a much clearer picture of what the foe is all about. And I do want to say, if you do have any questions as I go along, please don't hesitate to, to raise your hand and, and ask. So how are you paid? So the foe model is basically you're, you're getting a monthly payment for having patients roster. So it's a capitated payment model. And moving into the FOE model from the FIG or from fee-for-service, all of a sudden you have this guaranteed amount of income, roughly 75% every month, that you're getting whether you're seeing the patients or not. 
So in the fee-for-service world, you get paid every time you see a patient. You move to the faux world, you're getting paid regardless of whether you see that patient or not. So again, being strategic in how you're managing your patient roster is very important. No longer are you looking to see 50, 60 patients a day, just one, one after another, and go through as quickly as possible. But now you want to be strategic. You want to bring in those that are actually medically necessary, ones that you're going to be able to bill for out-of-basket codes and, and really provide optimal patient care to those that actually need it. If it's just a patient that just wants to come in and talk, great, book them out a couple months. Don't, don't leave those open spots for them to, to call in the same day to come in. Um, so the bottom line is throughput, throughput versus access. Again, no longer looking to see 50 patients a day, cut it back to 20 to 30 patients a day. So as you can see here, this is an illustrative breakdown of the different income streams. So your capitation payments, your fee-for-service, your net access bonus, your shadow billing, preventive care, and special premiums. And we will touch on, on most of these as we go along. And again, any questions, please let me know. So capitation payments. On average, about $200 per year per patient. So I always get the question, should I roster, should I not roster a patient? Easiest way to tell is what do you think that patient is going to do to you? Are they going to be coming in on a regular basis? Are they going to come in every week, every month? Or are they a 25-year-old male that is going to roster with you and not come see you for five years? It really is, you, you need to sort of adjust uh, your expectations of what you're going to have with that patient. As well, the capitation payments cover 126 fee codes that are considered in basket. Now those are not going to be paid when you see the patient that you get your shadow billing for. So you get your 15% shadow billing whenever you see these patients for one of the 126 codes, for example, in A007. All other codes are considered out of basket and paid at the full value. So as you can see here on the right, you have the breakdown of the comprehensive care payment and your base rate payment. Those are the two payments that make up your cap total capitation. Any of you who are in the FIG or came from the FIG model will, un will realize that the comprehensive care payment is what you were getting in the FIG model. All of a sudden you switch to the FOAM model, it jumps drastically with your base rate payment. So here's an illustrative breakdown again of what a patient is worth. So down across the bottom you have the age of the patient. Across the left hand side is the value every year. So as you can see, babies are worth just under $200. Then they slowly drop down. Females at the age of about 14 start to rise again. And males, not till about 30, 35, do they actually get uh, to be valuable of having them on the roster. But it always is good to have a nice balance across all age categories and across both male and female patients. Unless in some cases, which we actually came across recently, where one male physician only has male patients and the female physician only has female patients. So roster management, what is the right size of roster for you? And again, I get that question all the time. And there really isn't an answer for everyone. It really is dependent on what you're looking for, what type of practice you want to run. Do you want to have a lot of elderly patients? So you, yes, you need fewer patients because they're worth a lot more. If you're looking to have um, you know, a nice mix, then you're going to need a little bit more. If you want a very young roster, you're going to need a lot more. So it really is finding the balance roster size versus access to patients. So are you working five days a week? Are you working four days a week? Are you working three days a week? That is really going to determine how many patients you can actually see because, sorry, how many patients you can actually have on your roster. Because if you have 2,500 patients and are working two days a week, that's not going to work. But the flip side, if you have 800 patients, you really don't need to be working five days a week. So it really is finding that balance between roster size and access for patients. Rostering a patient, I'm sure most of you know this already, the Q200 is the only way to trigger rostering a patient. Um, very important, All, oftentimes we get the question, you know, I, I'm, last month I rostered 40 patients and they're not coming on my roster. First question I ask, did you bill a Q200? Sometimes the answer is no there's your answer. You want to make sure that you're billing a Q200 to make sure you're rostering those patients. Financial impact. Now th this is an interesting slide here. 200 patients is an extra $40,000 a year. Now in your minds, think about it. How many patients are you really going to see of those 200? Not, not very many, hopefully. If you pick and choose the right patients, the right demographics, 
the right balance of older, younger, male, female from 200 patients, you're really not going to see a huge drastic change to your, to your overall schedule on a given day or a given week. But your yearly income is increased by $40,000 approximately. So that, that's a nice size income increase. But again, you're only taking on 200 patients. And at the, in the grand scheme of things, probably not a huge deal. Again, ensuring people are rostered. Roster reconciliations is a big one. We oftentimes find that ministry roster versus EMR roster, big discrepancy. I had a physician not too long ago that we did a roster reconciliation for. She had 950 patients rostered with the ministry. She had over 1,200 in her EMR that she thought were rostered. That's a lot of money that she was losing out on she didn't even realize. So let's get into a little bit about fee-for-service now. So you can look at fee-for-service in two aspects, enrolled patients, non-enrolled patients. As I said earlier, for enrolled patients, you're getting your 15% shadow billing for those 126 in-basket codes. Everything else that's considered out of basket, you're getting the full value. Now, when you're seeing a non-rostered patient, you have both in-basket and out-of-basket um, services, but they're all paid at 100%. Keep in mind, though, in-basket services are limited to about just under $60,000 per year per physician. It is pooled together at the group level. So if you have 10 physicians in the group, 600,000, give or take, chances are you're not going to hit that level because it is at, on the group-wide level. So it's, if one physician reaches 100,000 and the other ones don't get to close to their 60,000 limit, there's no issue. But it is something to consider if you, work, if you have a walk-in clinic that you're wa uh, running in the clinic as well. So something to think about, but most of you won't have that issue. No hard cap in the first year of practice in the foe. I don't know if anyone is that new here, but something to think about as well. So some of the out-of-basket areas that we look at on a regular basis, diabetes management, smoking cessation, and after-hours billing. As well, in all, in your, all your folders, you're going to have what we call our practice billing guide or our cheat sheet, uh, which is the common out-of-basket codes that we see a lot of our physicians bill and we always get questions about. So it's a great guide to keep with you when you're doing your billings, just to, as a friendly reminder. Uh, on the blue side, you have the more common out-of-basket codes. On the other side, you have some of the special premiums, some of the preventive care bonus tracking codes, things like that. Um, again, that you, you can use yourself when doing your billings or that you can have your staff use as well. So let's talk a little bit about diabetes management. Now, this is a big one. You're $216 approximately per year per patient. I don't know how many physicians are just not billing this properly. They're billing their A7 just because it's easier. If you properly see your diabetic patient four times per year and then you bill your flow sheet, that's $216. If you have 120 patients, that's an extra $26,000. That's out of basket money. So that's, you're getting that full value. Very important now with the, with the changes in the ministry, with what they, they've, uh, the requirements for the diabetic. So you have to have three visits now before you can bill your flow sheet. This is something that we track for all of our clients on a regular basis. We provide them with a full list of all their diabetics, when they've had their visits, or when was their most recent visit, when was their earliest visit, how many they've had total, how many need to be brought back for another one, whether or not they were paid, whether or not they were rejected. It's something very important. It's, if you have the diabetics and you're providing the care, it's easy money that a lot of physicians are just throwing away. Smoking cessation. This is a, a trickier one. Um, the E079 added on to an assessment code, everybody can do. If you have a f patient that's trying to quit smoking and you have that conversation with them, go ahead, bill the E079. There, there's no reason not to. The extra $15, why not? For the follow-ups, this is where it gets a little tricky. A lot of physicians say it's not worth their time to do the flow sheet. Patients don't care enough. They don't want to come back. They don't actually want to quit smoking. They just want to have that conversation every once in a while. But if you are able to get them back twice per year, KO39, QO42 together, both out-of-basket codes. Again, if you're billing it twice per year, you're looking at almost $100 per patient in extra income. Again, if you have 150-odd patients, an extra $15,000. Why not do it? Access bonus. So again, this, this is a big one, patient management and, and outside use. Accessibility, and people throw that term around a lot. And, and what does it mean? 
And to everybody, it's going to mean something different because some of the more seasoned physicians are very used to a routine. They want to keep things the same way. Some of the newer physicians, we can sort of train them now to think a little bit differently about providing access and, and providing access in different ways. Whether it's leaving a whole morning open during the week for walk-in appointments, whether it's leaving you know, a couple spots in the morning, a couple spots in the afternoon, varying days of the week as well. Uh, it's really about making sure that your patients can be seen when they need to be seen. And of course, those, again, that are medically necessary, not just ones that want to come and hang out with you. Now, how do you do that? How do you let the patients know what your accessibility is like? What is your availability like? Collecting emails. Some people don't want to give their email, but as we move more and more into the technology world, it's a great way of letting patients know whether the clinic is open or closed, whether the doctor is in or not, sending some results if that's appropriate, or just having that line of communication with the patient. Again, not necessarily having them email you, but you being able to email them rather than bring them in, rather than have them call in. Providing extra spots, again, the days of the week is, is a big one. Now, something that our outside use management report will show is what days of the week are your patients chronically going to the walk-in clinic? Most of the time, that reflects on them not being able to come and see you in the office. So, for example, if your Monday, Mondays are spiking with outside use, let's change your schedule around a little bit. Let's leave a few more spots open on Monday so when the patient calls first thing Monday morning and says, my son, my daughter, my husband, myself need to come see you today. We're sick, we got sick over the weekend, whatever it is, you have spots open because if you don't have a spot open, they're going right to the walk-in clinic and that's gonna eat away at your access bonus. Bottom line, patients need access. So how do we manage outside use? Some of the best practices. Patient behavior is a big one we're not going to be able to control all, all of the patients, whether we like it or not. It's just not going to happen. Trying to understand what they're doing is obviously very important and educating them because they're not aware. I, I would say 90% of the population doesn't understand that they shouldn't be going to a walk-in clinic, not only for the financial reason, but the continuity of care is gone. If, you, if your patient goes to the walk-in clinic and then comes to see you the, the same afternoon or, or the next week and says, I went to the walk-in clinic last week because I couldn't get in to see you. They ran this test, this test, and this test. They could be right, they could be wrong. You don't know. All of a sudden, you're rerunning the same test. You're wasting their time, you're wasting your time, you're wasting tax dollars. It's not worth it. So educating the patients on, on what it means to go to the walk-in clinic. Again, some of you may want to have the financial talk with the patient, depending on who the patient is, but from a continuity of care standpoint is what I like to say. Letting them know that if you go to the walk-in clinic, I don't know what's going on. You, you can come and tell me, and you might be right, but you might also be wrong, and I might be giving you something that will counteract something that the, the other physician gave you. So keeping that in mind. Uh, open appointments during the day. Do most of you keep open appointments during the day? Yeah? Okay. I mean... That's very important. I mean, if, if you have a day fully booked and you can't get any people to walk in or call in, they're going straight to the walk-in clinic. But leaving those spots open not only frees up your time, you know, maybe the patient doesn't come in that day or in, for that time slot. Great, you have an extra 10 minutes, you can have a snack, you can take a breather, you can sit down for a minute. Um, but it really is important to have those spots open uh, on, a, on a daily basis. After hours care. Obviously, you all have after-hours care available, whether it's in your clinic or the clinic down the street or around the corner, whatever it is, letting them know that it's available, putting posters up, sending emails again, letting them know who's available, when they're available is very important. Referral patterns. Uh, sorry, um, who are you referring to? Does the physician that you're referring to for psychotherapy or sports medicine or anything like that have a focus practice designation? If they're just a regular GP and they're billing family codes, that's going to eat away at your access bonus as well. And that adds up very quickly. All the counseling codes, all the sports management codes, very, very high dollar value. They eat it up very quickly. So what do we do about that? We have to analyze the data. And that's something that we do on a very regular basis. We look at your outside use reports. We put all the data into our system. And it shows what your patients are doing and whether or not we need to move them from the roster to fee-for-service. Derostering, 
you want to go back retroactively. You want to get back as much money as you can that has already been incurred. So if you realize four months later that a patient has been going for addiction services or psychotherapy or whatever it is and they never told you, you never referred them, you want to retroactively go back to that first outside use visit in order to get back as much money as possible. Daytime access issue, again, leaving those same spots open during the day. Staff issue as well. Make sure your staff understand what the faux program is all about, why they shouldn't be telling patients to go to the walk-in clinic if they, can't call, if they can't get in to see you that day. Oftentimes we find that if a patient calls in, they say, can I come see Dr. Smith today at three o'clock? No, he's not available then. Okay, you should go to the walk-in clinic. That's obviously not something that we want to have our staff telling our patients. We want them to say, no, you can't come in at three, you can come in at another time, or you can come to the after hours this evening or tomorrow, or you can come in first thing tomorrow morning to see your doctor. We need them to understand the whole program. We, we, they're, you know, they're the front lines. They're the ones that have the most interaction with the patient before they come and see you. Making sure that they understand the program, making sure that they understand what needs to be said is very important. Uh, as I said, educating the patients as well. And the red flag codes. So as I was saying earlier, the special visits, the home visits is a big one now that we're seeing with an aging population. There's a lot more home visits happening. There's a lot more services that are providing home visits as well. If that's not something you do, no problem. You can either try and do it because there is a bonus paid for that, or you can de-roster that patient if you know that they're not gonna be able to come see you anymore and you're not gonna be providing them that home service. Uh, as I said, focus practice designation, sports medicine, allergy, pain management, sleep medicine, all these things eat up at your access bonus very, very quickly. So the impact of derostering, we, we always get a question, what is the financial impact of derostering? Why do I want to deroster? I'm just going to lose out on capitation payments. Yes, you are going to lose out on capitation payments, but you're going to more than make up for that in your access bonus. And what our report does is show you the financial benefit and the cost benefit analysis of when to deroster that patient. If you derostered a patient today because they started going to a clinic four months ago, you're going to lose because you're not getting back all the amount that was eaten away from your access bonus. That's why derostering retroactively, in some cases up to six months back, makes sense. Any visits you've had during that time will get topped up. So they were a rostered patient, you saw them for an A7, you, and within the time period that you're derostering, you, now you're going to get the full 100%. You're going to get that $33. Uh, as I said, all outside, uh, outside use will be removed. And moving forward, you're still providing them the same type of care most of the time. You're just getting paid differently. You're getting paid every time they come in rather than having them on the roster because they're not benefiting you by having, you're not benefiting by having them on the roster. You're actually losing out. So outside use reporting. So again, as you, as you see in your folders, what we do is a proprietary software that pulls together all the data from your outside use management, uh, outside use reports from the ministry. Now that everything comes electronically, we download it on a monthly basis. We put that information in. Similar to the RA, I would imagine not a lot of you look at those reports on a monthly basis. But again, it's a source of income. You should be looking to see what's going on. What am I, what am I losing? Who are my patients that are quote unquote abusing my time and the system? At a very high level, we're looking at what codes are being utilized outside of the clinic. A007, always gonna be the highest. We wanna try and avoid having those K codes and, and the A3s and, and all those high dollar value codes. What days of the week are contributing to outside use? As I said, if it Mondays are spiking or Wednesdays are spiking, adjust your schedule the day before, the, the same day. Try and figure out what patterns the patients are using. Are they Speak to your front staff. What day of the week are we getting the most call-ins? Maybe that day I'm not going to book any physicals anymore. I'm just going to leave a bunch of spots open during that day for patients to come in and see me. You know, again, on a Monday, people get sick over the weekend. First thing they do Monday morning is call the doctor. If they're not available, they're going straight to the walk-in clinic. So you'll see in your folder, so this is a list of 20 patients, and we're always going to provide you at least 20 patients. And again, we're showing you the cost-benefit analysis. So what are you earning in capitation during this six-month reporting period, and how much outside use was incurred during that time? And does it make sense to deroster the patient? 
On the far right, you can see the return column. Anything greater than 100% means you're not earning anything by having them on the roster anymore. They, outside use has far outweighed their capitation payments, and you're now basically seeing them for free. We can look at the number of services over how many months. Again, we look at the earliest date of outside use, the most recent date of outside use as well, and what services are being utilized outside the clinic. And physicians love this because they can have that conversation with them now and say, look, we know you've been going for psychotherapy, sports medicine, allergy injections, whatever it is. Now we know. Why did you not tell me about it? You know, if, if it's a home visit as well, why did you not tell me that you needed a home visit, that you couldn't come see me? I could have provided that service to you. So you can have that conversation with them. If they're a very good patient of yours and you don't want to deroster them, educate them. Let them know what it means to you, what it means to the system. Again, not necessarily from a financial standpoint, but from a continuity of care standpoint. Preventive care. Uh, as we end the, the fiscal year, we're, we're coming up more and more, uh, closer and closer to, to the, that time of year where we're going to look at all these categories. Um, 12,800 available to you. Obviously, you want to make sure that all your patients in each of those categories that are eligible for the service have had the service. You're going to get the report in April. Go through the list and look at the ones that haven't had the service done. Make sure that they, in fact, haven't. Maybe you build the wrong code. It didn't get tracked. It didn't get billed properly for whatever reason. You need to make sure that those are the patients that are, are, did actually not have the service, or if they did, you can use them uh, in your calculation. Again, you have up to six months to bill it as a, you know, the standard stale dating rule, so you have until the end of September. I do not recommend waiting till the last minute. We've seen far too many physicians call us literally on the 11th hour in, in September and say, I didn't do it, I need help, what do I do? Don't wait that long. It's, you know, if there's an issue, it's just making your life that much harder. Bill it as soon as you can. Take the time, either for you, for your staff, and have them do it as soon as you get the report in April. Some of the tracking codes, some of the exclusion codes are very important to know. Again, if they're not within the age group or if they're within the age group but not eligible for whatever reason, make sure that you're billing the tracking codes. Make sure you're billing the exclusion codes. This is a report that you're going to get now from the ministry. Again, make sure that you, you look at who they are and, and make sure that you're, if you have to de-roster a child that's within that age category and the parents don't want the, the injections for the childhood immunizations. If you have four children in that age category, three want the service and one doesn't, there goes your bonus. Something to, to really think about. Special premiums. $37,000 approximately available to all of you within the eight categories. Five transfer over from the FIG for anyone that was in the FIG or it still is. Uh, and then the extra three, the hospital office procedures and prenatal. Now, this is a, an interesting one because we always get the question, should I start doing one of these services to get the bonus? My answer is if you're interested in it. Because if you don't have any women on your roster that are in that childbearing age, you're not going to get your prenatal bonus. If you don't have any patients that are bipolar or schizophrenic, you're not going to get the serious mental illness bonus. Home visits, if your patients are getting older and you want to start providing that service because you know they're not going to be able to come to the office anymore, great. The, you know, the first level bonus is $1,500, second level is $3,000, $5,000, and $8,000. That's a lot of money that's available to you if it's something that you're interested in and you want to start doing. So some of the key takeaways for today. Ensure the patients being seen are actually on your roster. Again, roster reconciliation is very important. You have to know who is on your roster and who is not on your roster because, as I said earlier, missing 200 patients, $40,000 a year that you're missing out on. Remember to submit your Q200. Preventive care bonuses. Again, tracking codes, exclusion codes, very important. It makes your life that much easier because if you haven't submitted any of the tracking codes, you haven't submitted any of the exclusion codes, all of a sudden, April comes along, you get a report that's completely blank. Now you've got to go through and look at every single one of your patients. Have they had the service? Are they eligible for the service? It takes a lot more time. Be aware that outside use is a daytime access issue. Again, 
adjusting your schedule accordingly, picking the right days to have open spots. If Tuesdays there's no one calling in, great. Fill up your Tuesdays with physicals, fill up your Tuesdays with longer appointments that need to be pre-booked. Derostering retroactively, very important. Do not deroster a patient as of the day you're deciding to deroster them. Always go back. In, with our report, you can see what the earliest date of outside use is. If you're not using our report, it's going to be a little bit tougher to figure out how far back to go. In some cases, six months is, is a good number, but you want to make sure you're doing it strategically. Most importantly, we are here to help. We're, we provide service across Ontario. We provide service to individual physicians, group groups. We don't care how big, how small. We're here to help and make your lives that much easier. Some of the more seasoned physicians are going to say, well, I've been doing it this way for so many years. Why change now? There's always room to improve. There's always room to change the way you do things a little bit, to be a little bit more strategic, to earn a little bit more money. Yes, you are a seasoned physician. You've been doing it for so long. Retirement's just around the corner. Why not spruce it up a little bit? Earn an extra five, ten, twenty thousand dollars in the last couple years. Why not? That's it. For me, uh, here's our, my contact information. It's in the, the folder as well. If you guys do have any questions now, I'm more than happy to, uh, to answer anything. I'll start off. Okay. First of all, I just wondered when you were getting into the insurance industry, because we probably could use something like that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but going on into something more important, I was just saying, it's more of a comment, because we work in the insurance industry, and we work with a, large, a, a lot of group clients, and they will um, have a program for their executives with the med camps and the med points and that sort of thing for their executive level people, which for the most part really is counterproductive to the doctor who's got that person on, on a rostering because they lose out on the access, right? Absolutely. But what I think is really interesting, because we do this all the time, is, is that if you're negotiating one of them, and usually it's your, your, your CEO or ED that's negotiating this, they can actually negotiate that it is, that the fee is paid, and that, but that the OHIP, that they don't bill OHIP. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing to me the number of times if you went in and said, okay, we do not want the family doctor to be affected. And if the CEO or ED that, of the company that's negotiating this, I guarantee you that they will not see any change in, in price. Right. So they can send their executives there. It's not considered whatever you call it, access Outside issues use, or yeah. anything else. You just have to know to do it. And I just say that because I don't know how you educate anybody, but if you know that they're, you know, CEO material and that sort of stuff, all you have to know is, is that who's ever negotiating that, just say, take it, or sorry, um, don't don't take the OHIP billing. Right. Don't take, and then the access issue's not a problem, and nobody's the worst for wear. But I don't know how you educate the right people. Maybe you've got a comment on that. So <laughs> from our perspective, that doesn't come up a lot. Uh, we don't have a lot of physicians who work with top level, or at least that we are aware of, that have those top le level executives that are going to those you know, boutique firms to have their healthcare uh, provided to them. So that's not something that we do see. But again, if your patient, if you know your patient is going there, chances are you just de-roster them and, and you see them once in a while. Those patients that are going to these boutiques they don't necessarily have a family physician that they're seeing on a regular basis anyways. Once in a while, they'll pop into a doctor that they had you know, 20 years ago. But I think if the patient knows that they're going to be going to one of those places, let your physician know. Or from a physician standpoint, ask the patients. If you're going to one of these places, let me know and I'll de-roster you. No problem, you can still come and see me whenever you need you're just not going to be on the roster. I will tell you, Josh, that in London, it's very interesting because we don't have a lot of high-level businesses compared to, with executives compared to Toronto and that sort of thing, but we do have law firms and that sort, and they do send, they do, they do do it for their lawyers absolutely without question. And so if I know about it, I usually say, because we work in the medical field so much, I usually say, just make sure that it, it goes outside of OHIP. Right. 
but for the most part, it, it is a real problem around here. And then I get the other situation where the lawyers phone me up and they say, I don't want to go because I'm going to anger my GP, mm -hmm. right? So I don't want to do this. And then the law firm is saying, we want you to go because we don't want to have any problem medically. And we right. want to make sure you're okay, right? So they're like between two sides. I, I think the simplest thing is, again, educating the patients that being on a roster or not on a roster with your family physician isn't going to affect that much. You're still going to be able to go to that doctor. You're still going to be able to get care from your doctor, a walk-in clinic, this boutique, wherever it is that you're going. So at the end of the day, being on a roster, a lot of patients don't even know whether they are or aren't. So I don't think that's a, a huge deal. But again, if you are aware that one of your patients is going to one of these executive health centers, you roster them. And, and that's it, you're, gonna, you're still gonna get paid when they do come in, and you don't have to worry about, again, educating them to not have them bill through OIB. Or, if you wanna go through that and they understand that, great, let them know to tell the executive health team, do not bill through OIB. I had a question, Josh. I, I'm just curious, how, when you're talking to a, a primary care physician, uh, does your approach change or do your, does the results of your review change much whether they're affiliated with a family health team or not? No, they, they don't. Um, I mean, you're within a family health team, you're within a FOA as well. So you're still eligible for all six income streams. We're looking at the same reports. We get the same reports from the ministry regardless, and we're showing you the same things. From a management standpoint, it might change a little bit because you have certain other um, ancillary services available to you. So that would be, a, again, a talk specifically for the physician to say, if you have a dietitian available, or if you have a nurse, or if you have whatever, utilize that. Don't necessarily take everything on your shoulders to do, but utilize your team and outsource whatever can be outsourced to free up, again, time for you to see those that are medically necessary. Do we have more questions in the room? No? Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. I do appreciate you guys. I do appreciate you guys. I do appreciate you guys.